Our last speaker for this uh, block right now is Dr. Carol Strohecker. She directs the Center for Design Innovation, a multi-campus advanced technology research center of the University of the North Carolina System. An MIT graduate, Dr. Strohecker taught at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and has earned four US patents for her collaborative work in interactive media, tools, and methods. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to be here. And I brought something for you. There's a handout to augment your conference packages. It's waiting up front. And it looks something like this, but I dare you to read it anyway. It has to do with framing and ideas relevant to what I'm about to explain. So years ago, as a young graphic designer, I realized that even though the work I was doing was described as communication, it had a lot to do with education as well. And as I was putting things together that combined words and images, I was helping people to learn about different topics. But I was troubled by the fact that a lot of my decisions seemed arbitrary. It didn't seem that I had a set of guidelines, uh, design principles, if you will, a set of ideas that would help me to make deep and reasoned decisions that really would help to guarantee good work. So I was seeking a set of ideas, and I realized that meant I was seeking people who had those ideas, and it was a kind of Parthenon. Through a lot of hard work and no doubt a lot of good luck, I ended up at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I studied for eight years and for the next dozen or so had involvements in and out. And so I was immersed in a culture of innovation, an environment saturated with advanced technologies and wonderful people. In the back of this iconic building, there's a courtyard with more buildings that have chiseled into the upper facades the names of scientists like Galileo, Newton, Pasteur, Curie, and so on. And my Parthenon ended up with a few of those, but it ended up being even more diverse. It looks something like this. It includes psychologists, artists, mathematicians, cyberneticians, architects. And I wondered, how did this happen? I found myself at a conference a few years ago at the Getty, the Image and Meaning Conference, where the organizers had put together the abstracts of the attendees into a computational linguistics algorithm and charted where they landed in this space bounded by information, computer, and design. And I was stunned to see myself right at the middle, showing what an interdisciplinary being I had become. It started at MIT. When I arrived there in the mid-1980s, people were coming together to form the Media Laboratory. They had been working together in diverse groups across the campus, and now were beginning to converge in the new building. And some of the people were coming from the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab. They were very interested in how people learn. There was an approach to coming up with so the, some of those computer algorithms that had to do with modeling how human beings learn. And the idea was that we're not just sponges, we don't just absorb ideas, we're continually remaking ideas and making meaning for ourselves. And this is what constitutes the process of learning. Furthermore, it happens through interactions with the environment and things in the environment. And the nature of those things can influence the nature of the ideas. Furthermore, it's very individualistic, so it's very diverse, and of course it involves emotion as well as cognition, and it can be promoted by actively making something. This is a big idea that learning is in fact a creative process. Here's a quote from this book by one of the co-founders of the AI lab. From the first days of life, a child is engaged in an enterprise of extracting mathematical knowledge from the intersection of body with the environment. But whether we intend it or not, the teaching of mathematics as it is traditionally done in our schools is a process by which we ask the child to forget the natural experience of mathematics in order to learn a new set of rules. And in that book, Papert puts forward what's become known as a micro-world, 
It was called Turtle Geometry, and it was implemented in the Logo computer language in the very early days of the evolution of the personal computer. And it's looking at the conceptual domain of differential geometry and showing that by characterizing an object, a little so-called turtle on the screen, later it really did look like a turtle, but it has only two properties in this little micro world. It has only position and heading, and many of you will recognize those as the properties of a vector. And by simply moving forward, turning right, moving again, you can eventually create an object like a square, and by continuing to repeat movements like this, you can form more complex geometric figures like spirals and so on. And the key idea here is that as you understand what it is that makes up a square. You come to understand the notion of vector and angle and uh, these different forms and relationship. Your knowledge of that object consists of these different operations, the way that that entity was created. Some of you will remember this device, and you may recognize something that it has in common with that microworld of turtle geometry. But if you read the patent for the Etch-a-Sketch, you find a lot of discussion of the materials and the mechanism by which the scratching happens and so on, but nothing about how wonderful it is to use that toy and the skill that you develop in being able to operate those very simple uh, forward and back <laughs> movements, and certainly the act of creating curves out of straight lines. I was fascinated by this concept of microworlds and thought I'd give it a try in the realm of topology, which is a branch of mathematics that deals with spatial relationships. And even in by tying knots, which by the way, there is a formal mathematical theory of knot theory, so it's kid stuff, but it's also very serious formal mathematics stuff. Um, we con can see how some of these concepts can be developed. So I had found not only an approach to design, not only an approach to learning, helping people learn, helping people help themselves to learn, but also an approach to understanding how that happens for different people, an approach to learning research. And what I realized is that I was becoming like a, a natural scientist, just as Galileo, when he wanted to study the stars, realized he had to get involved in making the telescope. And just as Darwin, when he wanted to study creatures in their natural environments realized he needed a microscope to understand some of the, the cellular uh, mechanisms at play and so on. And just as the Curies to study radium created a piezoelectric device, these microworlds became in my mind, a kind of microscope to help us understand the development of concepts as people engage in learning processes. And so I set about working with colleagues to develop a set of microworlds of my own using the increasing visual and uh, audio capabilities of the evolving computers. And a set of these microworlds resulted. This one called Bones is in the helping people just experiment with the notion of balance. And there are these little bones. They have very simple properties, mass values, which accumulate as you put them together to form a little critter. And the software calculates where is the center of mass. It makes a projection to a polygon at the base, which is formed by the points of contact with the ground. And very simply, if that projected line falls within the polygon, the creature can balance, and off he goes and if it, if it falls outside of the polygon, he crashes into a, a, a little pile of bones. So the design principle here, sorry, I can't play it for you, it's fun. The design principle, of course, is to pare down so you can really identify what are those particular elements and operations that characterize the domain of interest. So here, of course, it's science, of course, it's physics, it's motion study, but we're looking particularly at balance and the role of the center of mass in balancing. Likewise, in this kid, looking again at topology, but now working with elements of the city image as defined by Kevin Lynch, and imagery from Cezanne, so people make maps, and then the software translates to street-level views that maintain the spatial relations, so you have different ways of looking at them. Here's a microworld in the domain of geometric symmetry. By playing with very straightforward rotations and reflections, you make the beautiful patterns. And here, characterizing social dynamics in cellular automata fashion, very simple push-pulls, and these uh, creatures 
issues become um, aggregate and interesting in the way they relate to one another. This is kind of a time kit experimenting with cyclic timing based on the dance strategies of Martha Grant. So through this work, I did come up with a set of principles, thinking about learning as essentially a creative process, essentially a process of designing, and trying to enable that by, first of all, what are important ideas to focus on, and in the 21st century, the notion of dynamic systems, as we think about environment and economy and so on, is a, a wealth of content for this kind of work, and you see some of the other principles there. So from here, um, the Media Lab from MIT was engaged in some dialogue with various groups in Europe and ended up partnering with the Irish government to create Media Lab Europe. And through a wonderful opportunity, I went to Dublin to start a research group called Everyday Learning. You see there the Guinness Hop Store in which we were situated as part of an urban renewal project. This was part one of many abandoned buildings in the old Guinness Industrial uh, part of, of Dublin. And they were trying to reclaim a lot of these buildings, uh, digital technologies being a big part of the strategy. A lot of the buildings had become disused because through pasteurization, different inventory methods and so on, they simply were not needed anymore. In the everyday learning group with colleagues, we experimented a lot with sensing technologies and mobile technologies. A lot of the things we made sort of foreshadowed the apps that are so common now. But in this genre called collect and reflect interfaces, you would gather information and then create things with it. Um, in the case of nature trailer, you would annotate maps that you had used on a nature hike. Smoke rings, we were collecting uh, indicators of environmental tobacco smoke and then projecting potential health effects, and with text tales, working with photographs that people in different neighborhoods had created, and then um, projecting them large scale onto structures in the city and augmenting them with SMS texting. This was pre-tweet also, pre-Twitter. Um, also did uh, electronic jewelry workshops. We brought some of this here to Sika a while ago. So Media Lab Europe no longer exists. MIT had pulled out. But there is still in the Guinness Hop Store a lab which resembles very much the way that we were operating Media Lab Europe. And they continue to turn out some of these high-tech applications. You know, the Irish economy had preceded ours in booming in the 90s. And of course, it preceded ours in busting. But now it's going to be interesting to see what happens as we all go about recovering. Ireland had had very good luck in an urban renewal project at Temple Bar, where they had reclaimed many industrial buildings and turned it into an arts district. And now that was and continues to be the attempt in the so-called digital hub district, which is west of there and which is the site of these old Guinness buildings. So even in these challenged times, the digital hub is operating at full occupancy and they're turning out some interesting work. So this area caught my attention. This is where the Yadkin River Valley meets the Cape Fear River Basin. This is a view from Pilot Mountain of the Piedmont area of North Carolina, where we are sitting now. And of course, this is an area that also traditionally had an economy based on agricultural products uh, translated through industrial processes into products that we all enjoyed. But a lot of that has changed. Uh, no longer can we rely on jobs being available in translating wood to furniture, cotton to textiles, tobacco to cigarettes. We need a new strategy. And just uh, around 2003, the same time when in Ireland people were talking about creating the digital hub, People here in Winston-Salem and the Triad were talking about using advanced technologies as the basis for part of an economic recovery strategy. And this is a recent formulation from the Sustainable Communities Planning Project, but it's been a refrain for many years now. So many jobs lost, and we need a different strategy uh, as we enter a more knowledge-based economy, focusing on innovation, design, production, and creating vibrant, livable communities.
So um, this was the kind of discussion that was happening within the state legislature and the University of North Carolina system. You see here a map showing the 17 campuses of the UNC system. Two of those schools, of course, are located here, Winston-Salem State University and the UNC School of the Arts. And the Center for Design Innovation is a partnership of those two schools working with Forsyth Technical Community College. On a project basis, we can and do do and must work much more broadly across academia and business and with members of community service organizations all toward this economic development mission based on advanced digital technologies. So this is a view from the location where CDI is now. We're downtown in a temporary space in Winston Tower on floor 21, think 21st century. And as we look out on Winston-Salem, we see here the derelict buildings of the old RJR manufacturing operation, which now are being reclaimed. And as you know, the Wake Forest Biomedical Research Building just opened in the North District of the Piedmont Triad Research Park. Here's a view of the Central District, looking at that huge gulf of land that separates East Winston and um, Winston-Salem downtown through Highway 52. So CDI is part of this effort to create a large urban uh, research park. We started in Winston Tower four years ago. It was an empty room, and you see here images of how we've built up into a fully functional high-tech research and education center. At the same time, we are designing a future building, which will be in the southwest corner of the intersection between Highway 52 and Business Route 40. You see it there, the, the red mark in the south district of the Piedmont Triad Research Park. To the right, uh, to the east, is the purple area, Winston-Salem State University. To the left, Salem College and Old Salem. We are almost directly across from God's Acre. And then, of course, north, we have the central and north districts of the research park and the purple area downtown. So these adjacencies are extremely important to us, and we're working with the architects to consider multimodal transportation routes, ensuring good circulation uh, good, uh, for the, the collaborations, collaborations that, that we, we do need. We've, we've done, done careful site analyses of wind patterns, solar patterns, water flows, aiming for uh, the design of a green facility to support the high-tech research and education. And here you see some of the situation on the site and the floor plans. The building will look approximately like this. We're still uh, fine-tuning, but we did have a groundbreaking uh, just on Monday, so things are moving along very nicely. And in the meanwhile, we have been developing our research and education programs with two pathways in mind, keeping in mind always that what we're up to is economic development, and as we, through the research as we generate new ideas and new intellectual property, these we can spin into new products and services, which of course will lead to new companies and new jobs. And not only that, but entirely new kinds of jobs of the sorts we're hearing about today. And then in tandem, the students are working side by side with the research, so those new ideas, new techniques, new methods uh, are also leading to uh, ways in which we help not only students, but lifelong learners, displaced workers, what have you, to come in and learn about the new ideas through workshops, which we can gradually refine, expand. Sometimes students are situated for internships, and um, then gradually we hope to spin out a new um, academic program. There's so much more to say and I'm running out of time. We're focusing on motion capture. We have some novel methods, not just the connect the dots, but we can see the full imagery. We have a portable system too. We are doing uh, laser scanning to augment that. We have 3D printers for rapid prototyping. I want you all to come and see some of these wonderful objects. You have to hold them to really appreciate them. Um, we are part of a national network of excellence sponsored by the National Science Foundation working broadly across arts and sciences. And this is just a range of the activities that we have going on. And I want to invite you to the workshop that's coming up for projections onto the RJR building and look at the startups that we have helped to catalyze, building up the email list. We're planning for electronic textiles in the future building. And I just want to stop now and invite you to come to the Center for Design Innovation. Help us to create the future. Thank you.
question. Is this on? Hello. Oh. Dr. Strohacker, one mm -hmm. question. Um, what advice would you have to college students thinking about jumping into this field? Create. Hang out with your laptop, hang out with your iPad, make things, make things, make things. Thank you very much.